You're dying. A tooth infection has spread to your jaw. The pain is unlike anything you've ever felt. A constant, throbbing agony that makes eating impossible. Your face is swollen. Fever burns through your body. Without antibiotics, you have maybe days, possibly hours. Now imagine you're not in a hospital. You're in a cave in Spain 50,000 years ago. You're a Neanderthal, and you're about to do something that modern science wouldn't discover for another 49,950 years. You're going to cure yourself with antibiotics. This isn't fantasy. This happened. We found the evidence locked in ancient teeth, in the hardened plaque that tells stories the bones can't. And what those teeth revealed shattered everything we thought we knew about our ancestors. So what did cavemen actually do when they got sick? The answer is more sophisticated and more human than you could possibly imagine. We like to tell ourselves stories about our ancestors. That prehistoric life was, to quote Thomas Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short. That our ancestors clawed their way to dominance through violence and competition. Survival of the fittest, we say, as if fitness only means strength and speed and sharp teeth. But the bones tell a different story. That toothless Homo erectus from Dmanisi wasn't some exception, some lucky individual who found unusually kind companions. He was part of a pattern that stretches across nearly two million years of human existence. A pattern that shatters our assumptions about what natural human behavior looks like. Think about what it meant to keep him alive. This wasn't a one-time act of kindness. This was a daily commitment. Someone had to gather extra food. Someone had to take time away from their own survival tasks to prepare soft foods. In a world where a broken ankle could mean death, where every calorie mattered, where predators stalked the edges of every camp, they chose to carry him forward. Why? The easy answer is that maybe he had knowledge they needed. Maybe he remembered where water flowed in the dry season, or which plants could heal a fever. But that's our modern minds trying to find a transaction in every interaction. The harder truth might be simpler. They kept him alive because that's what humans do. Because even then, even at the very beginning of our story, we were already the species that couldn't walk past suffering without trying to help. Fast forward 1.75 million years, northern Spain, a cave system called El Cedron. And in that cave, preserved by perfect conditions, lies a Neanderthal jawbone. Nothing special about that. We found plenty of Neanderthal remains. But this one held a secret that would flip our understanding of prehistoric medicine completely upside down. Trapped in the dental plaque, that hard stuff your dentist scraped off were chemical signatures, microscopic time capsules. And when scientists in 2017 finally had the technology to decode them, they found something that shouldn't have been there. Salicylic acid, the active ingredient in aspirin. But this Neanderthal died 50,000 years ago. The individual had a dental abscess. You can see it in the bone, a nasty infection that must have caused excruciating pain. The kind of pain that keeps you awake, that shoots through your skull with every heartbeat. And in his teeth, Along with the aspirin compound from poplar bark, they found something else. Traces of penicillium mold, the same type of mold that produces penicillin. Let that sink in. This Neanderthal was self-medicating with aspirin and antibiotics 50,000 years before Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, before humans invented writing, before we planted the first seeds or built the first permanent shelters. But wait, you might think, maybe it was accidental. Maybe he just happened to eat some moldy food and chew on random bark, except the same cave yielded other Neanderthal remains, and their teeth told different stories. Different diets, no medicinal plants. This wasn't random, this was targeted, this was knowledge. And it wasn't just El Cedrone. Neanderthal sites across Europe have yielded evidence of medicinal plant use. Yarrow, chamomile, plants that taste bitter, that offer little nutritional value, but that we still use today for their healing properties. These weren't happy accidents. This was medicine. Picture that Neanderthal 50,000 years ago, holding his jaw, the infection throbbing. Maybe an elder showed him which tree to seek out. Maybe he learned it from watching others. But somewhere in that exchange was the birth of pharmaceutical knowledge, the understanding that nature held remedies, that pain could be eased, that the body could be helped to heal itself. They were doing science without knowing what science was, running clinical trials where failure meant death, building a pharmacopoeia one bitter herb at a time. And somehow, through observation and memory and teaching, they got it right. The poplar bark really did ease pain. The moldy bread, maybe kept in a special place, maybe recognized by its particular smell or color, really did fight infection. We spent centuries thinking of Neanderthals as crude cavemen, too stupid to compete with modern humans. But they were treating 
killing infected teeth with antibiotics. While we were still 45,000 years away from figuring out that diseases weren't caused by bad air. The year is 2020. A team of archaeologists is working in a limestone cave called Liang Tebo in Borneo. They're excavating carefully brushes and dental picks when they uncover a skeleton, young adult, Stone Age hunter-gatherer, nothing unusual, until they get to the left leg. It's missing, not broken off, not gnawed away by animals, surgically removed. The cut is clean, deliberate, right through the tibia and fibula. The bone shows clear signs of healing, not the jagged scarring of trauma, but the smooth, rounded regrowth that only comes from successful surgery. This person lived for at least six to nine more years after losing their leg, in the middle of a tropical rainforest, 31,000 years ago. Dr. Tim Maloney, who led the excavation, described the moment of realization. We were completely stunned. This rewrites the history of medicine. Think about what this surgery required. This wasn't a desperate hack in the heat of battle. This was precision work. The surgeon, and we have to call them that, knew exactly where to cut to avoid the major arteries. One wrong move, and their patient bleeds out in minutes. They knew how to prevent infection in one of the most bacteria-rich environments on Earth. They knew how to manage pain well enough that their patient didn't go into fatal shock. And perhaps most remarkably, they knew when to stop. The amputation is above the ankle, through the narrowest part of the lower leg. Any lower, and they'd hit the complex joint structure of the ankle. Any higher, and they'd encounter larger blood vessels. They found the sweet spot that gave their patient the best chance of survival. This wasn't luck. This was expertise. In the 1860s, during the American Civil War, battlefield amputations had a mortality rate hovering around 30%, and that's with metal instruments, some understanding of anatomy, and at least basic concepts of wound care. This Stone Age surgeon, working with sharpened stones and whatever natural materials the rainforest provided, achieved something that wouldn't be matched for another 30,000 years. But the technical skill is only part of the story. Think about the aftermath. This young person, probably late teens or early 20s, woke up missing a leg in a world without wheelchairs, without prosthetics, without even crutches as we know them. Every day for the rest of their life required help. Someone had to assist them over rough terrain. Someone had to ensure they got their share of food when they couldn't hunt or gather effectively. For six to nine years, this community made it work. They adapted their pace for someone who couldn't walk normally. They shared their resources with someone who couldn't fully contribute to getting them. In a small band where every person's labor mattered for survival, they chose to carry this burden together. The skeleton was found in a deliberate burial, placed carefully in the cave. Even in death, they were still being cared for still valued, still part of the group. This wasn't just surgery. This was proof that 31,000 years ago, humans had already decided that every life had value. That healing was worth the risk. That community meant nobody gets left behind. The cave is called Shanidar. It sits in the Zagros Mountains of northern Iraq, and between 70,000 and 45,000 years ago, it was home to Neanderthals. In the 1950s, archaeologist Ralph Solecki began excavating. What he found would challenge every assumption about Neanderthal life. They called him Shanadar One, though the excavation team nicknamed him Nandi. When they pieced his skeleton together, they found a medical chart written in bone, a life story told in healed fractures and adapted joints. Start with his skull. The right eye socket was crushed, probably in his youth. The blow that shattered the bone would have destroyed the eye itself. From that day forward, Nandi was half blind in a world where seeing predators meant survival. His right arm told another story. The humorous, the upper arm bone was withered, probably from nerve damage. The arm had been useless for so long that the bone had thinned from lack of use. Some researchers think the lower arm might have been amputated. Either way, Nandi couldn't hunt, couldn't effectively make tools, couldn't even carry his full share of the group's belongings during moves. The bones of his inner ear showed abnormal growths that would have caused significant hearing loss. In a world where the crack of a twig might signal danger, Nandi was effectively deaf. His legs and feet were riddled with arthritis. Every step would have been painful. His gait would have been slow, uneven. In a nomadic society, he was someone who couldn't keep up. And yet, the wear patterns on his 
his teeth show he lived into his 40s, ancient by Neanderthal standards, the equivalent of reaching 80 or 90 today. His bones show no signs of malnutrition, no evidence that he was fed scraps or given less than others. He was integrated into the group's daily life for decades after his injuries. Someone helped him navigate with limited vision. Someone ensured he was included when the group moved to new hunting grounds. Someone made sure he had warm clothing he couldn't make himself, food he couldn't catch, tools adapted for one-handed use. For at least 20 years, maybe 30, Nandy was living proof that Neanderthals measured a person's worth by more than their physical contribution. He couldn't hunt mammoth, couldn't sprint after deer, couldn't stand watch against cave bears. But he belonged. He mattered. He was theirs. And Nandy wasn't unique. The same cave yielded Shanadar III, who lived with a partially healed stab wound to his ribs. Someone had tried to kill him, but his group nursed him back to health. La Chapelle aux Saints in France revealed an elderly Neanderthal so arthritic he could barely move, yet he too lived for years in that condition. Sight after sight, skeleton after skeleton, the same pattern emerges. Healed injuries that should have been fatal, disabilities that should have meant abandonment, lives that continued long after their bodies failed them. This wasn't occasional charity. This was systematic care. This was community. We used to think compassion was what separated us from Neanderthals, that they were the savage ones, while we were the species capable of love and mercy. But Nandy's bones tell us we had it backwards. Compassion isn't what made us different from Neanderthals. It's what we shared with them. It's what made us both human. So how did it work? How did bands of 20 to 50 people manage to develop medical knowledge sophisticated enough to perform amputations, dose antibiotics, and care for the disabled, without writing, without formal education, without anything we'd recognize as medical infrastructure? The answer lies in the most human of technologies, teaching. Picture a small band making camp for the night. The fire crackles. Children watch as an elder, maybe a grandmother past her hunting years, sorts through the day's plant gathering. This one, she might say, holding up a bitter leaf. For the belly pain, but only a little, or the belly pain gets worse. The children wrinkle their noses at the smell. They'll remember that smell. Knowledge accumulated slowly, purchased with suffering and sometimes death. The first person to chew willow bark for a headache was running an experiment with their own body. The first person to pack a wound with certain mosses was gambling with infection. But when it worked, when the pain eased, when the wound healed clean, that knowledge became precious. Too precious to die with its discoverer. So they taught. Parent to child, elder to adult, healer to apprentice, not through textbooks, but through stories, through hands-on practice, through constant repetition until the knowledge settled into memory as deep as knowing which berries killed and which sustained. Some people showed aptitude. Maybe they had steadier hands for delicate work. Maybe they remembered which plant grew where better than others. Maybe they simply had the stomach for dealing with blood and injury. These people became the keepers of medical knowledge, not doctors in any formal sense. They still hunted, still gathered, still participated in all aspects of group life. But when someone was hurt, when a child burned with fever, when a woman struggled struggled in childbirth, the group looked to them. The archaeological record hints at these proto-medical specialists. Burials with unusual grave goods, grinding stones that might have prepared medicines, collections of minerals with antiseptic properties, arrangements of plants known for healing. We can't prove these were healers, but the pattern is suggestive, and the knowledge they accumulated was impressive. Beyond the headline discoveries, the aspirin, the antibiotics, the surgeries, there was a whole framework of care. They knew to immobilize broken bones. Skeletons show fractures healed in good alignment, suggesting the use of splints. They knew wound care. The successful amputations and surgeries required not just the procedure, but weeks of follow-up care to prevent infection. They understood pain management. Not just willow bark, but probably positioning, distraction, maybe even primitive forms of anesthesia from plants we haven't identified yet. They had to. You can't perform an amputation on a fully conscious, thrashing patient with stone tools. They recognized that healing required more than medicine. The survival rates suggest systematic nursing care, regular cleaning of wounds, help with daily functions during recovery, emotional support through trauma, the kind of comprehensive care we associate with modern hospitals, delivered through community effort. Most remarkably, they adapted their treatments to available resources. 
The healer in Borneo used different plants than the healer in Ice Age Europe. The techniques that worked in dry climates were modified for rainforests. This wasn't rote memorization, but active problem solving, medical thinking. By the end of the Paleolithic, this accumulated knowledge was staggering. Thousands of plants cataloged for their properties. Surgical techniques refined over millennia. Diagnostic skills that could recognize and respond to various ailments. All held in memory. All passed down through words and demonstrations all at risk of being lost if a single generation failed to teach the next. But they didn't fail. From that toothless ancestor at Dmanisi to the last hunter-gatherer bands before agriculture, the chain of medical knowledge remained unbroken, each generation building on the last, each healer adding their own discoveries to the collective wisdom. When we finally invented writing and began recording medical knowledge, we weren't starting from scratch. We were simply finding a new way to preserve what humans humans had been teaching each other for nearly two million years. The herbs mentioned in the earliest medical texts, the surgical procedures described in ancient papyri, the healing practices recorded by the first civilizations, all of them echo with the voices of countless unnamed healers stretching back to the dawn of humanity. Before there were doctors, there were humans who doctored. Before there was medicine, there were humans who healed. Before there was any system at all, there was the simple revolutionary act of one human looking at another suffering and deciding to help. That's not the beginning of medicine. That's the beginning of us. The next time you take an aspirin, think of that Neanderthal in Spain, holding his aching jaw, reaching for the bark he knew would help. When you see a surgeon's careful hands, remember those Stone Age healers who cut clean and true with sharpened stones. When you watch someone help another human who can't help themselves, know that you're witnessing something ancient, something that predates art and agriculture and every city ever built. We did didn't become human when we discovered fire, or invented the wheel, or split the atom. We became human the moment we decided that the toothless deserved to eat, that the injured deserved to heal, that the broken deserved to be whole again. Two million years ago, in a harsh world that killed the careless and consumed the weak, our ancestors made a choice that defined us forever. They chose compassion, they chose community, they chose care. And in making that choice, they didn't just ensure their own survival, they ensured ours. Because every time we help someone who can't help themselves, every time we ease another's pain, every time we refuse to walk past suffering, we honor an unbroken chain of care that stretches back to the very beginning of our story. We prove that after all this time, through all our changes, we're still the species that keeps each other alive. We're still human, and that's what we've always been.